It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and today's guest is Hope Ishii, who is an associate researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. Hope, you've got a fascinating topic to describe today. It's cosmic dust, and of course, people really aren't familiar with the term. So can we start off just Tell us a little bit, cosmic dust, what does that mean? Cosmic dust, so cosmic dust, the term comes from uh, the fact that the dust comes from out elsewhere in the cosmos. And um, it basically refers to the, 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 um, the dust that's produced by bodies like asteroids and comets. Um, comets, when they actually release dust as they sublime, and asteroids uh, oftentimes in collisions. And some of this dust actually makes its way between the planets uh, to Earth and reaches a, an orbit where it actually crosses the Earth's orbit and comes trickling in through our stratosphere. And huh. so we are so, able to so collect some of it. When we're referring to cosmic dust, this is material which lands on the Earth, or you go with spacecraft to pick it up, or you a rover driving on Mars will look at cosmic dust. What, what, what? Usually we t we're talking about the dust that arrives at the Earth. Okay. Um, this is, the, this is the, the term that was given to it. And, um, uh, the reason that this dust is so interesting is that it comes from the small solar system bodies, the ones that didn't end up in, uh, in large bodies where it got hot enough and high enough pressure for, for the bodies to differentiate and for the, the materials to change a lot. And so a lot of the materials that we're finding coming in in this dust have, have um, changed very little since the beginning of the solar system. All right, so these represent perhaps the, some of the earliest parts of the solar system. So their chemistry or their isotopic ratios or their Yeah, they, they have diversity. very very undifferentiated chemistries. So they overall their chemistries look a lot like the average chemistry of the sun, of, of our solar system taken mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, they contain uh, little bits inside them that are actually remnants from, from um, their production in other stars. That, that predate our own solar system, so-called stardust. Right. So, so to backtrack a bit, are you a geologist? Are you an astronomer? Are you a physicist? Somewhere what do you do? <laughs> Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Uh, I like to call myself an astro-material scientist. <laughs> I see, it rolls off the tongue very easily, yes, okay. Yes, so, so uh, I basically study these, um, I study the materials um, using microscopes as opposed to the telescopes that an astronomer would mm -hmm. use. Um, but, but ultimately, we're looking at the same kinds of questions. That is, um, what, what were the conditions um, during the, the earliest part of the solar system formation? What, 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 what happened? What was going on? How did these materials come to be um, in the state that they're in now? Um, and so we do this by uh, uh, almost a forensic study of these right. materials that, that we can... So it's a detective yeah, story in, in laboratory, yeah? Yes, it is, yes. Yes, right. a detective story. So either either we can look at materials that come to us to the Earth, like the cosmic dust, or we can we can also go out to return to, to fetch materials and bring them back. To and for our viewers, when you talk about dust, are these particles the same size as dust in my house, or are they bigger or smaller? Or, or, you know? Some of the dust can be uh, like. Um, dust you would find in your house. Some of it can actually be fairly large, but for the most part, um, most of the dust is small, very small, microscopic. Um, the majority of the cosmic dust that we collect is around 10 micrometers. That's um, about a tenth of the diameter of a human hair. And Real so small. it's not the kind of thing you can see with the naked eye. Um, but there are larger particles that okay. do come in. They, they come in with less frequency. Now so you a 100, 100, micron, 100 micrometer diameter particle uh, lands about one per square meter per day. Oh, didn't know <laughs> that. And you brought some slides along just to give us a, a, a better understanding of what it is you're talking about. So if we can go to the first slide, please. A and I guess here we're seeing cosmic dust equals construction dust, and we're seeing uh, the sun on the left with some rocky asteroids going out to the colder parts of the solar system, presumably, right? Yes, and the, 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 um, the materials that I'm most interested in are those that um, come from comets. And the reason is it's kind of displayed in this schematic, and that is that the, the comets formed far enough away from the sun that the temperatures were cold enough that all of the water was present only as ice. And so uh, everything in those 
cometary bodies was essentially in cryogenic storage. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a kind of a time capsule. And so the dust that's coming from these bodies, that from this, from these time capsules, is a, it's a way for us to essentially look back into the past and see what was available at the beginning of the solar system to form our planetary systems. And, and I, I get the impression that you actually can infer where some of these particles come from in a, in a general sense, is that correct? You, there is, a, uh, yes, uh, to some degree. Um, so the, the cosmic dust that we collect, because it's just serendipitously coming through the atmosphere and we're, we're gathering it, we don't necessarily know exactly what parent body object that which particular dust which particle comet. came from. But we can tell something about what type of body it came from. So we can, we can distinguish particles that um, likely have a, an origin in a comet from uh, particles that maybe come from an asteroid that would have experienced more, um, more processing by liquid water as opposed to having and only ice. And you see that comet. from the chemistry of the particles. And the, and the mineralogy. And you have the ability to study the chemistry or the chemical composition of this really small piece of material that is less than a tenth the diameter of the human hair. We do. <laughs> Easy, right? No problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Piece of cake. No, we, we do. We have, mi we have microscopes that are capable of looking at extremely fine scales. And I have a slide later that we can look at okay. in the second half yeah. of the segment that, that shows some well, of this. But we can, we can actually use um, electrons to look at um, both the chemistry and the, the structure of these materials on an extremely amazing. fine scale. Amazing. Yeah. Now we've got a, a second slide. I, um, I, I guess here we're looking uh, at an image of a comet that was passing somewhere, it looks like Golden Gate Bridge, yes. uh, um, in 2007. And why is it important? You, here you've got a specific comet coming close to Earth. Yes. Close. Yes. This one wasn't quite so super close. I, I included this slide for two reasons. One was to show what happens to a comet when it comes into the inner solar system and gets close enough to the sun to warm up, then those ices that are part of the comet start to sublime away. They go from the, the solid ice phase to a gas phase, and that re actually releases dust particles. And so this is one of the big ways that, we, that cosmic dust is produced and then can find its way to the Earth. And then, um, yes, there are some, there are some um, dust streams formed by comets and also some formed by asteroids that the Earth um, passes through and that are, that are known from astronomical observations. And so we can actually go and specifically target collections to that dust stream from and that And some object. of our so viewers might be familiar with uh, the, the background here. I, I believe when we get meteor showers at some times in the year, we're actually passing through the tail of a comet. So for most people just looking up in the sky, it's a spectacular light show. But from your point of view, that's where you would be getting a higher number of these small particles coming out yes. of the surface. Yes, okay. yes. So, so uh, I'm sure some of the viewers have gone out to see the Perseids or the Leonids, right. and those, um, those are named for the, from, for the uh, mo usually for the constellation that the, that the dust stream appears to come from. But yes, when, when we have those meteor showers, those beautiful uh, streaks of light across the sky, that's, that's dust coming that's, in. That's that, the that time to go like out to a day or two <laughs> later. And how does, uh, you, know, you work for NASA, you get NASA grants. How does NASA actually do this kind of collection? Well, NASA actually um, has been collecting this kind of dust for a long time. But starting about in the mid-1980s, uh, NASA began um, flying stratospheric aircraft. And so these are airplanes that have extra long wings um, so that they can stay aloft um, at higher altitude, almost twice the altitude that um, commercial aircraft fly at. And um, they are flown with little flags on their wings with um, an, an adhesive on it, it's a silicone oil. And they fly for hours and hours and hours and basically are sweeping the air of these particles come back down to, to the close, close them up, cover them up, come down and land, and then those are examined in the lab. And that, so that was the, the, historically that's been the way that most cosmic dust has been collected. And would they collect like one or two during a flight, or do they get, you know, the, the wings get heavy with all this dust? <laughs> How much material is, is up there? So it depends on the on the duration of the flight, and it depends a bit on how um, how much how many dust streams that the Earth has actually been mm -hmm. been crossing through. Um, but uh, 
So in perhaps an 18 or 20 hour flight, um, the, the flags are actually fairly small area. And so you were, you're um, really collecting um, over a small area, but at very high speeds and sure. for a long There's amount a of time. So you, you of collect, yeah, you're passing a large volume of air over the collector. Um, and I don't know the actual numbers for, for typical, um, typical amounts of particles, but I do know that a lot of, a lot of particles also fragment, and so you could probably end up with hundreds of, of particle bits. Yeah, being on, on hit a by a supersonic airplane with this particle collector sort of thing. I'm not sure if the next slide actually shows one of these airplanes or whether it's uh, the slide after next, but let's take a look and see. Uh, so these uh, are the particles, right? Yes. So the, um, we're looking at a comet on the top left mm -hmm. and microscopic views of different scales mm -hmm. down Increasing. to 100 nanometers on the bottom right. Yes, so that, that's, and this is a typical cometary particle that's being shown here, kind of a scale of uh, going up in scales of 10 order of magnitude right. from, from about a 10 micron particle. And then on the right hand side, um, there is an image that shows a crystal from within one of these particles. And what you're seeing on that, there's some fine lines that go through the crystal and also a, what looks like kind of a, a, a blurry rim on the surface. That's actually the result of um, space exposure to the solar wind. So um, high energy solar ions actually pass through crystals in these, in these um, particles and leave a little track of disorder. They basically disorder the, the crystal structure by, by passing heavy high energy ions through the crystal. And then the, the lighter solar wind ions, hydrogen and helium, create this amorphized rim on the surface. And this is one of the ways we can prove that um, these particles were in space for right, on the as of opposed 10, to, to desert meters. dust from the Sahara or Precisely. something like that. Precisely. I, and I see on the slide 30,000 to 40,000 tons per year. Yes. That's a lot so of that's material. An, an estimate of how, how much mass of extraterrestrial dust is still coming down onto the Earth that's and accreting. Cool. Seems a lot of material. I mean, probably would if it was all <laughs> in one place, that would cause a lot. If it of were problems. all in one yeah, place, yeah, yeah. it would be a problem. And, and the, the last slide from this session, I think, shows us just our collection mechanisms. Yeah. So here's a couple of different ways. We got the high altitude. Look, they look like an ER2 or a U2. Yeah. These are one. these are the WB57s. NASA also used to fly some ER2s. It's the it's the research um, version of the U2. Um, and uh, so these are the planes that are used for the stratospheric flights with this, the, the very large wings in order to have enough lift to stay aloft at 20 kilometers altitude. Um, that, that was the historic way of getting cosmic dust and co the comet dust that I'm interested in. And then NASA also, of course, has, um, has flown some comet missions. Um, and there was uh, one that came back in 2006 with comet dust that was actually captured within um, that was special the Stardust titles. mission. That was the yeah. NASA Stardust mission, yes. Which, what, you were part of? Or yeah, I was part of the science, yes, yes. The, the science, um, the participating scientist analysis team on that. That was very exciting. Um, it, so each of these collection methods has its advantages and its disadvantages. But um, one of the, the, um, the points that I had wanted to make was that um, that's kind of expensive. Flying, yes, it must flying be. a mission is yeah. a very expensive way to get comet dust. And of course, um, the stratospheric flights also are relatively, they're significantly cheaper than a, than a NASA mission, but, uh, but also a fair amount of money yeah. to manage. Well, we're about ready to take a break, hopefully. Right now, uh, I'm looking forward, in the second half of the show, we'll actually look much closer to Hawaii and what you're doing at the university. But let me just remind the viewers, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today is Hope Ishii who's an associate researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And we'll be right back. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solutions. How to make a brighter day What do we do? We've got to give a little love Have a little hope Make this world a little better Make it a better Try a little more Harder than before Hello everyone
everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on ThinkTech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on ThinkTech Hawaii. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and my guest today is Hope Ishii, who is an associate researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, and we're talking about cosmic dust today. And now, Hope, is there a connection with what you're describing about dust collection in Hawaii? Why, why are you here, for example? Well, it's actually very exciting because we have just started a new collection of cosmic dust right here in Hawaii. Uh -huh. And um, as I was saying just before the break, um, our, historically our ways of collecting cosmic dust, this, this dust from asteroids and comets and extraterrestrial um, sources, have been pretty expensive um, and, and difficult to, to do. Um, what we are actually doing now is taking the same concept that's used in the stratospheric flights of sampling high volumes of air. Right. Um, and we are doing it here at Mauna Loa, the Mauna Loa Observatory. Interesting. What, why Mauna Loa? Why not uh, at uh, Waikiki Beach? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Much better to be at Waikiki <laughs> Beach. Oh, it depends. <laughs> and we've um, got a picture of Mauna Loa here. And uh, uh, I think that's you in the top uh, right. And uh, your husband, John Bradley, correct? Yes. Yes, we both we set up this collection together. So Mauna Loa Observatory is at an altitude of about 11,140, 11, I think, feet. And um, the picture on the lower left there is the high volume air sampler that we're using. And so the, um, the air actually goes through a, a very fine pore filter, gets pulled by a pump um, through this filter. And um, it's attached to the setup is also um, a, a basically a device that measures the wind direction and the wind speed. And so when the wind is blowing down the mountain, down slope, um, and is a high enough speed, we collect, we, we turn the pump on and we collect mm -hmm. cosmic dust. Um, the reason that uh, Mauna Loa is so much better than Waikiki is because um, the slopes of the, of the mountain actually heat up during the day and cool off at night. And this um, because of the high altitude, this um, ends up generating a downslope wind at night that is strong enough that it actually overpowers the prevailing winds coming across the island. And the downflow of the wind actually brings the, the a clean layer of the stratosphere. The lower troposphere actually ends up descending and being pulled down to Mauna Loa Observatory. So I would imagine it helps that the observatory is a, a relatively high elevation, so you're above a lot of the water vapor and the dust. Yes, you are. You, uh, during during the daytime, the upslope winds actually tend to bring some of the, yeah. the, the crud yeah. that we don't but like not, up you're, to you're, us. You're not collecting. And we don't collect during that time. And then the, the downslope winds actually um, pull, push that push that down, and so instead of get, getting material from what's called the planetary boundary layer, where dust and dirt gets kind of uh -huh. stirred up, we are actually sampling winds right from the lower troposphere. I'm, and this I'm is the same um, the same reason why Mauna Loa is so great for measuring carbon dioxide. And, and why at the uh, the weather observatory in Mauna Loa is that the infrastructure, or is it? Because they're doing meteorology, or, or uh, yeah, a, a combination of these things. So, so the the um, again, this unique meteorological condition is is uh, ah, here's the here's the, the slide, slide which shows <laughs> a, a cartoon of Mauna Loa, and we've got winds coming in off of the northeast, and there's the Mauna Loa observatories and things like. That. Yeah. So um, the the this this unique. Um, uh, atmospheric condition is is ideal for getting clean air that's mm -hmm. that's relatively clean of terrestrial contaminants. Also, because we're in Hawaii on an island in the Pacific, it's fairly remote. We don't have a huge amount of um, of anthropogenic, that is, human-made industrial contaminants, and we, we get a lot less terrestrial, that is, earth um, earth particles as well. So, so it's the much cleaner. The, the astronomers uh, will often look at either Mauna Kea or Chile, um, but in this case, if you're trying to collect clean air. It appears as if Mauna Loa is much a better site 
that in Chile. Is there anywhere else in the world which is also a good site? Or? Yeah, Mauna Loa is great. It, all, the other reason why Mauna Loa is, is amazing is because there is this National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration facility there that is already collecting a lot of the, the weather data, the, the meteorolo meteorological data that informs our collection. Um, the other place where uh, this attempt, this uh, approach is being attempted is at, in the Antarctic. Mm -hmm where again, uh, the air is significantly cleaner. But much more expensive. Much more expensive to, Logistically to go to Logistically very difficult, McMurdo particularly Station. during winter, for example. Yes. Yeah, so yes. terrific. So yet again, Hawaii is an ideal place for scientists to come and do. You know, you, you, you're here, you've got national awards, and you're trying to do research here in Hawaii. That's yes, terrific. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrific site. It's a yeah, wonderful yeah, yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got another picture of one of your sites uh, up next. And let's take a look. Uh, so. Here we see, yes, I recognize um, Mauna Kea in the background, I guess, at the weather station, right? Um, is this one of your students? Or yeah, this is actually um, Leanne Teodoro. She's a student who's been um, working with us on this project. She's a Hawaii Space Consortium um, student and uh, Space Grant, excuse me, Hawaii Space Grant Consortium student. So she actually uh, went up to uh, the, the Mauna Loa Observatory to exchange a filter one month and um, on the right hand side in the in the picture is um, uh, Marty Martinson who's on the staff at the NOAA managed Mauna Loa Observatory who's helping us uh, take care of this, the, the collection and actually help send us filters so it's a, it's a very uh, and they change the filters every month right now we're changing filters every month we're also looking at doing these targeted timed yeah. collections where mm -hmm. we uh, where we collect to coincide with dust streams crossing the earth. Fascinating. Yes, it's been wonderful. Uh, and to how, have how this much material do, with do, this do you find? Yeah, like a, d a dozen particles in a month or hundreds? We're, st we're actually still fine tuning our, our collection parameters a bit to re reduce the um, the amount of extra. Um, there's there's a there's a, t a delay in the time when the winds change from upslope to downslope. We're mm -hmm. still we're still refining fine. that a bit. But um, we're we're getting plenty of uh, particles, but not not too much of the terrestrial material okay. so far. So and of course, another advantage is I believe you've got a fantastic lab here at the University of Manoa, right? And the next slide I think will show either you or one of your students. Um, we've got a lot of capabilities here in Hawaii, not only to go and collect cosmic dust, but also to analyze it. So can you describe? Here we've got another one of your students. It seems as if this is the Space Grant student. What's she looking at? Yeah, so this is Leanne. She's actually looking at one of the filters that we collected that's been mounted to, uh, to image it and carry out chemical analysis um, in a focused ion beam instrument, which is a, a specialized mm -hmm. electron microscope, mm -hmm. um, electron flush ion microscope. And so she has been surveying particles that were collected and looking for ones that have compositions that would be consistent with primitive materials. And on the computer screen there, she's looking at enlargements, presumably, of little particles which are inside that gizmo with lots of Yes, the thing that looks like a bit of an uh, electronic <laughs> yeah. porcupine yeah. In a microscope. <laughs> and then she's, um, she's using the controls to move around and analyze different right. particles. But, but this raises a question in my mind. How did you get involved in this kind of work, or how do students, what career paths do they have? I mean, this is top flight research science that you're doing here at Hawaii, right? And how did you get started? I think this is a, this is a great way to get started, uh, is, um, is undergraduate research programs, um, getting, getting undergraduate students involved in actually doing hands-on research themselves. This is a terrific way. This is, this is how I got interested in doing research and how I really got my start. And then in terms of this particular field, um, I kind of fell into it, actually, <laughs> as I suppose a lot of us do. <laughs> so I, um, I, j I started working on the NASA Stardust mission to begin with, actually. And, um, right. and so I was looking at comet dust and interested in looking at other, um, other types of comet Would you dust. count yourself as a technologist or somebody who studies cosmic chemistry, so you're more of a chemist? or? or, or yeah, what, what I, like the big, I like the big picture. Uh -huh. I like to understand the big picture. And so although I, I, um, I do manage a couple of um, fairly specialized microscope tools, I, I prefer to be able to use whatever tools I can get my hands okay. on to try and understand the, the, a, a story. Now, you like the big picture, but any discoveries yet? Uh, what, yeah, what, what would be a game-changing discovery from your point of view? 
Uh, right now, we are trying to understand, we're trying to get enough sample and big enough sample to be able to analyze the organics in primitive comet samples uh, to a level where we can say something more definitive about the, the inventory of organic materials that was available for the initiation of life on Earth. And that is something that, um, that scientists have been able to scratch the surface on, but we, because this, most of our comet samples are so small, we're in, just, we just don't have enough material. Do, do, to do, do you the, find anything which hints at being from outside our solar system? Even? That would be quite a find if you had uh, a piece of material from. Well, now some of our star. some of the some of the dust that is found in comet samples is definitely remnant from birth in other stars outside our solar system uh, before our solar system formed. It's, it's yes. very similar to. Uh, we've had Ed Scott on talking about meteorites and the formation of the early solar system. This is just another piece in the bigger jigsaw puzzle of how our it solar is. system formed, where the planets come from, what else is out there. It must be a fascinating career to be involved in this sort of thing. And from the sound of it, Hawaii really is at the forefront of this new low-cost technique in trying to it is, right, and this low-cost technique is going to end up being uh, important. This high-volume sampling here on Earth is going to end up being important because it's just getting very expensive to do um, and, this kind and, of work. And it's great to see that you're bringing in young students to sort of pick up where your research is going and uh, get to be form more familiar with some of the instrumentation. It's exciting. You know, yeah. we, we all have this desire to understand where we came from and how our world came to be, and right. this is... Uh, this is a piece of it. Okay, well, I last hope we, um, we're getting near the end of the show, and I know you've got lots of other things which you could tell us in particular about some of the instrumentation that you have. So let me just ask you now, would you be willing to come back at some later time just to tell us about some of the cool equipment you've got in the basement at the university? Of course, oh, of course, I'd be fantastic. delighted. Uh, excellent. Well, let me just remind the viewers that you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Mana. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today has been Hope Ishii, who's an associate researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. So thank you for watching, and please join us again next week at the same time. Goodbye. <laughs>